Well, good morning, garden friends. It's Landon Gilfillan with Pepper and Pine Garden Design. And today I'm gonna to show you what's happening in the garden in June. So it's been a month since I did my first official tour in the garden and not much really seemed to be happening at that time. You know, there was definitely some growth. Everything was pretty small. It didn't look like this. And what's crazy is in a month, this is gonna be <laughs> almost completely covered in green. It's so fun how fast things grow in the garden. So what I thought I would do today is walk you through what's happened in the garden since my last garden tour and show you what's going on now over in the West Garden that wasn't even planted when I did the last tour. Some things have been harvested and taken out of the garden. Some things are just coming to fruition now. So it's really exciting to see how a whole entire month can change, greatly change what you're doing in the garden. Let's just start from the top uh, back in early April. And you can find those videos listed on a playlist I'll put here. I got all my cabbages and cauliflower and broccoli and kale and dill and dara and what else? All kinds of stuff out. I ended up losing some of those plants to a crazy flood slash frost perfect storm epidemic. <laughs> Uh, but really the garden recovered from that really nicely. I did lose all my broccoli and cauliflower and had to replace some of those things, but that's okay. I actually have a whole bunch more broccoli started inside that'll be moving out here in the next week or so. And the cabbages have done amazing. The dill, I have dill springing up in places. I didn't even know I planted dill. That's how it goes. And my Swiss chard has really started taking off. The kale is being kind of slow. I'm not sure why. Um, but it's finally kind of taken off here in this last week, but the cabbages are beautiful. So here is the bright lights Swiss chard. Now these were transplanted to the garden. I grew them from seed indoors and this was not the first batch that I grew. This is probably the second, um, but it has really taken off here in the last week and it's just beautiful. All those really pretty pinks and yellows and whites. I will only ever buy the bright lights Swiss chard just because they're so beautiful in the garden. And then here are the is the early Jersey Wakefield cabbage that I'm growing this year. This and the Red Acres purple cabbage. Both of them look really beautiful. But I did notice something really interesting about these two varieties. The one on the right, which is the early Jersey Wakefield cabbage, has been having issues with caterpillars. And I'm going to do a separate video talking about those caterpillars that you find on your brassicas and what to do about them. But what I've noticed is these are the cabbages getting the damage from the caterpillars and these not so much. So it's just an interesting observation that the caterpillars seem to like the early Jersey Wakefield cabbage better than they do the Red Acres. So in the future, if I don't want to deal with that, maybe that's the variety I need to grow. Right here is the dill that I planted way back in April and it's really taking off. It's perfuming the air. I just love the smell of dill. And I've got little bits of dill just popping up all over the garden, which is really fun because it's a beautiful herb. I love it when it flowers and the scent is really supposed to deter pests. So I'm hoping once it gets larger, it'll do a better job of warding off these caterpillar moths and butterflies that come in here to lay their eggs. But you can see down the row, all this cabbage that's coming in and you can see the damage from the caterpillars um, and I've been picking those off and dealing with those to hopefully get this thing back up and running but a lot of damage from the caterpillars happened this week and again I'll do a separate video talking about how you can handle those caterpillars and what to do about them in a more natural way but as you can see here this red acre cabbage is really hardly touched compared to the early Jersey Wakefield cabbage. Isn't that beautiful? I just love these colors. Behind the cabbage are the potatoes that were the first thing I put in the garden this year. I did some seed potatoes that I grew and some seed potatoes that I had ordered and seed potatoes I found at the store. So I did a whole bunch of different potatoes this year, all different varieties. Um, and there's some spotty, germination is not the correct word. I'm not sure why these, these are big holes are here. I kind of think these might be the seed potatoes that I did that are a little bit more spotty than the ones I got from the store. But I'm definitely having a lot of 
success here in this row, the front row, but it's the back row where I'm seeing more open areas. And that's okay, I'm gonna have plenty of potatoes this year, and I may just come back in and fill those in with flowers or something along those lines, just to kind of make this space look more cohesive and really more beautiful. Now on the second row here, I have more of the cabbage, more of the same. And it was right around here is where I started planting the broccoli or cauliflower that was killed and I ended up replacing it with a, a lot more cabbage, which is fine. And I always say plant 30% more than what you need just to make sure that you get your crop, especially if you're dealing with pests of any sort, kids who step on plants or anything that might destroy what you're trying to do. Now what's been really exciting this past week is that the chamomile has finally bloomed. It's so beautiful. I just love looking at it. Now really you're, you're supposed to harvest this when the buds look like this. Not like this. This one's right pretty much past the point, but a little bit more like this. That's when you want to harvest them for tea. Um, I have lots of chamomile growing and in this garden, so I may let this one have a little bloom time and so I can appreciate its beauty before I come out here and harvest it for tea. But how fun to harvest fresh chamomile from your garden to go use it for tea in the evenings. And my kids have really taken a liking to tea, so it's fun for them to come out and, and <laughs> harvest from this and a lot of the other herbs that we're growing for tea in the garden this year. So the chamomile has done great. I planted this in early April as well. And out of all the things I planted, I really think the chamomile fared the best during that really bad cold spell and um, flooding that we had back in early April. And then back behind me here is the Dara. It is in the carrot and dill family. It's also known as Queen Anne's Lace. But this one is a more of a cultivated variety that has really beautiful mauve colored rose, not really rose, mauve colored flowers. And it's just a beautiful um flower to have in the garden and i see that my first flower is about to bloom so i grew these last year as well i grew these from seed and um if you know what i'm talking about with queen anne's lace you know how beautiful they are and they can be considered a weed we do have this all over our property but this one like i said is a more cultivated variety it's not as invasive as your normal queen anne's lace um, but the color is what i'm really excited about so i'm excited to see these bloom probably here in the next week and just a beautiful specimen of cabbage right here isn't that interesting that the one next to it has been completely eaten up by caterpillars and then this one is completely untouched so i'm definitely going to want to get out here and make sure that this one stays intact and then like i said i've been dealing with the caterpillars on these but that is what this is supposed to look like now next here to the cabbage i've got um bunching onions grown down the row here the garden cats are starting to come in this is thor and they like to get right in my way right in the camera they like to try to steal my coffee so this is going to be interesting i can't keep them out of the garden <laughs> so anyway i've got bunching onions that are really kind of starting to come in here i'm excited these are onions that i grew from seed this year it was an experiment i was trying uh, other than just doing onion sets, which you can see my onion sets are huge all throughout the garden here. Those have done really well. And I specifically planted them with my cabbages to help deter any bugs um, because the scent of onions and alliums really are abhorrent to most pests. And for the most part, the cabbages that are planted right next to the onions have done a lot better than these over here that have no onions around them. So per not a perfect system. But I will say that the, the cabbages planted by the onions have done better than those that are not. So there you go, companion planting at its best. Here I've got a bunch of rutabaga that I multi-sowed um, after I lost a bunch of my crops. I just came in here and put some seed in the ground that was probably mid to late April. So we'll see what these do. Rutabaga can be sown, multi-sown. They're probably better sown um, in singles. But I was just kind of doing an experiment. Here's a single one here. These are multi-sown and I've just kind of come through and pulled out the little ones that are going to get in the way from these really developing a nice big root. Um, so these are definitely not ready, but I will be keeping my eye on them so I can get some nice footage when they are. Now I'm just teasing out the smaller ones here. I hate pulling out plants, but I would like these to develop a nice big head. So here are the onions that I planted from sets, again in um, early to mid-April. And these look really nice. They're huge already. They've got these really nice hardy stems on them. 
I need to check the maturity dates on these to remember when they'll be mature, but I'll tell you your sign is normally when you start seeing the scapes come in with the flowers. So I've got a bunch of them showing flowers. So that's gonna be an indication that we're getting closer to harvest time. You can also dig down around the base of the plant and see if there's a bulb forming, which I don't really see one yet. I'm also not digging too far down. So this one is not ready yet, but it will be here in the next month or so. I have to show you this cabbage head. This is by far the best cabbage head in the garden. Look at this right here. It's almost firm. This one is really almost ready to be harvested, which is so exciting. And thankfully the caterpillars have not touched this one. <laughs> Unlike the one next to it, um, this one is looking really nice. This here are the cauliflower that I actually planted from start. I had an anonymous viewer that saw my video about losing all my broccoli and all my cauliflower and they actually donated some money to replace some of those plants. So these are the cauliflower that I purchased to replace them. Now I have not been thrilled with their growth. They really have just taken off here in the last week or so, which is a kind of a testament to what kind of weather they like. You know, ironically, there are definitely um, some varieties that like the colder weather and some that like the warmer. The description tag was not very descriptive. <laughs> so it did not really tell me the variety. It didn't give me as much information as I really would have liked. But in my mind, most cauliflower is cool or a cooler season plant. But really, they just did not take off until the weather warmed up. So I think they'll do fine out in the garden now. I don't think I'm going to have issues with bolting or anything like that. It's just they've had a really slow start. You can see down here how much bigger some of these are. And the ones right next to them are so much smaller. Which, how crazy is that? One foot over to have such a big difference in size. Now, I will tell you that we've been having some uh, raccoons in the garden and they've been kind of messing around in this area. So that may have stunted the growth of some of these because this was right where they were kind of tracking through. Um, and this little section here, it looks a lot better. So you just never know what's going to happen in the garden and why. I mean, look, as we move on down, you can see how much smaller these are. As we move up, they just get bigger and bigger. Moving along in the garden, Here's the cauliflower and the shallots that I'm growing this year. I was really wanted to grow some shallots and I planted them here with these cauliflowers and they are looking awesome too. And I'm starting to see their little bulbs come up here as well. If I can get that to focus. They have a much thicker base, which I think is interesting. And it almost looks like there's two plants here, even though I planted one and there's a couple areas where it looks like that. But if you think about a shallot and how it develops with those separate bulbs, that would explain why we're seeing the separate stems because they are probably developing from the separate bulbs under the ground, which is really cool to think about. Here's another example. Here's the spring garlic that I planted. As I've said in other videos, I really prefer to plant garlic in the fall, but that just didn't happen this year. So I wanted to do an experiment with growing garlic in the spring and so far it's done really well. Um, I really haven't lost any plants. They're not as hardy looking as the onions, but they still look really great and I believe I'll get a good harvest from them. So this year growing the spring garlic might actually work out. And then next to that is one of three of my strawberry beds. This was actually a broccoli bed originally, um, but when I lost all my broccoli, I actually replaced it with strawberries and nasturtiums and decided that I would start broccoli indoors later and then instead of trying to replace it early in the season. And there's a reason for that. I'll explain here in a minute. But again, the strawberries have been coming in really strong this past week, and we've been eating from them as they come in. But next year, this will be a really awesome strawberry bed, as well as the two I have planted over here um, that we can harvest from and hopefully put back some of what we grow. So I've talked about this in other videos, but if you've missed it, the reason that I've decided not to replace the broccoli in the early spring was because in Southwest Michigan, Michigan specifically, and I'm sure in other areas of the country, we have a really short spring. It goes from being really cold to really hot, really fast. And for plants like broccoli, spinach, cilantro, arugula, 
those plants, the minute that have that real extreme temperature change will bolt. And that's exactly what happened in my garden this year. We went from like 70 degree days to 90 degree days and my all my spinach and arugula and mustards bolted like within a day or two. And most of those I've already taken out other than the ones I've left for beauty and to collect seeds from. So broccoli can be the same way. If it's been accustomed to a cooler temperature and then all of a sudden those temperatures spike, it will consider that uh, stressful. And a lot of times when a plant is stressed, it goes into survival mode. So it'll send up its flowers or bolt in order to produce seeds, in order to keep the plant going, right? Producing offspring for the next season. So that's why plants bolt because there's usually some sort of stressor, whether it's the temperature, which is what we normally experience or drought or any other stressor a plant might experience um, in order to survive it will immediately go into flowering, producing babies, producing seeds. And you're, once it's bolted, pretty much the leaves or whatever it is you're trying to grow, the head, if it's a broccoli, will become tougher and not as edible um, as it was before it bolted. So that is why I decided to wait to dry growing broccoli in the summer season where the temperatures are more consistent throughout the season to um, prevent the bolting. And then I also will be growing some towards the end of the season when it's cooling down to get a fall and even winter harvest. And you can see my blog down below, how to grow broccoli in Southwest Michigan. If you're really interested in trying to grow broccoli this year, there really is kind of a nuance about it, but I think it will be really fun um, experiment to see different varieties and how they produce over the season and even doing the overwintering broccoli like with the purple sprouting broccoli that I'm going to be trying this year as well. So check out that blog post. It really can be for wherever you are in the country, but I wrote it specifically for Southwest Michigan region. Uh, but all of that can be adjusted to your specific hardiness zone. Moving on in the garden space, uh, I am now looking at what I called my greens bed, which is where I had the mustard and arugula and spinach, all of which has bolted, which you'll see here in a second. And I've replaced those greens with another round of carrots and radishes. I've talked a lot about my carrot and radish inner planting trick that I did this year and have absolutely loved. And I will post that video here for you. Um, but basically I lay the carrot seed down, I cover it, and then I put the radish seed on top of it and the radishes will open up the space for the carrots to grow through. And so far I've had the best radish and um, carrot germination that I've ever had. Now, it might be a little too late in the season to try to get radishes to grow without bolting. And I knew that when I planted these this past week. But my purposes were really more for the carrots and not so much for the radishes. Because radishes develop so quickly, 30 to 40 days, I might get a harvest out of them. But again, if I don't, that's okay. Uh, I'll just pull them out and then the carrots will pop through. So here are the carrots that I planted back in April. Uh, with the radishes. I've already harvested all the radishes, but you can see how well the carrots have come in. Now, there's a couple spotty places here, but for the most part, where I planted them, they've done really well. And then I just came back in here where I took out all the spinach and the arugula and have planted several rows of different kinds of carrots and different kinds of radishes. The green that you're seeing here are the Brussels sprouts, and I interplanted those knowing that I would be harvesting these greens in time for these Brussels sprouts to start taking over the garden space. And as you can see here, I've got a mustard that is bolted. Isn't it lovely? I just love these little yellow flowers. So I've left it in there for the beauty aspect, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull this one because it's falling over and it'll open up the light and the space here for these um, Brussels sprouts to really start taking off. This is a sunflower that reseeded from last year. I've got several of them coming in and I'm just letting them grow because I love sunflowers in the garden and especially volunteers. So I have a nice little sunflower going here in my, my greens garden. Now I would love to find out what variety of mustard this is. I did a mustard uh, mix when I planted these, but these have been much slower to bolt than the rest of the mustards. And I love the leaves on these they are so big and they're tender. And so I really want to find out what variety of mustard this is because I may just grow this one in the future. Um, I just really like it. I've got some frilly endive lettuce growing here. A couple of those. 
small one over there. So I'll be harvesting these later in this week. Um, and then some more of the Swiss chard. Now this was the original Swiss chard I had grown back in March and transplanted out and thought I had lost. I mean, these babies were pretty much gone um, when we had that frost back in April, uh, but they have come back with fervor and they look great. So I'm actually growing some more Swiss chard in the house that I'm gonna come out and fill in this area with, but these are really starting to take off. Um, so I'll be harvesting these from these this week. And then here's the rest of the strawberry patch here. And I can see we've got one growing there. And then a random planting of radishes, lettuces, and carrots. Uh, we just did a, this was, this was planted um, before I planted the strawberries, which is why it's kind of randomly in the middle here. But this will eventually all be cleared out and I can fill this in with strawberries in the next year. But I've been harvesting radishes out of here. The carrots are starting to come through. The mustards are bolting. Some of them aren't. So we've been harvesting from those. Some mizuna here, which I love. Um, this was another mustard mix. And then some romaine lettuces and um, little gem lettuces over there. And dill that reseeded from last year. So this is fun because this is just good to have in the garden. Of course, it's a family member of the carrot, so they should be happy together. Um, and I've got a lot of little dill coming in all over the place. So this was just kind of a random garden, but I am getting carrots in here and a lot of these lettuces that we can harvest from. And eventually this will just fill out with carrots and dill. If you watched my how to grow asparagus video, this was completely empty when I did that video. I had planted potatoes down the row over there. My blue at a round rondac and purple Viking potatoes, which I'll show you in a minute. And then I had put this whole row of asparagus crowns here and they have all really come in. Now they are nowhere near as big as the asparagus crowns that I had planted last year, which are over in that part of the garden. I couldn't find them whenever I was trying to plant this asparagus, asparagus bed earlier. I didn't know where they were. And then they came up like a month later and they are definitely probably four foot tall now. And if you remember from that previous video, I talked about making sure you give your asparagus plenty of space because as they mature over the years and they go to fronds after you've harvested them, they can get up to six feet tall depending on the variety and they can get rather wide. So I probably won't have to stake these this year. They probably won't get that big. But in the years to come, I will put like stakes, trying to get my hand in the right place, on either side of these asparagus with some twine just to hold them in place as they grow. Um, but next year, my plan is to fill out the rest of this row where the potatoes are with some more asparagus. This row of potatoes that I planted much later than those over there have done so much better. Even when we had that cold snap a few weeks ago that killed all my tomatoes, these potatoes were pretty much unaffected. Whereas those over there really took a beating from the cold snap. These look great. So I think what I've learned from this season is I will be planting my potatoes out much later next year, probably a whole month later than what I did this year. I planted those very early April. Um, and because we still have those late frosts and cold snaps that really can affect their growth and stunt their growth. And that may be why I have some of those open spaces over there. And potatoes just, once they have their leaves out, they really don't like that colder weather. And they grow so fast, there's really no reason for me to start them that early. I was just getting impatient. <laughs> but these right here that I planted in early to mid-May look amazing. So I'm going to stick with doing that here in Southwest Michigan and not feel in a rush to get my potatoes in the ground. Now what I'm really excited to show you is the progress that's happened in this bed here, which I believe was the last bed that I planted out. I'm pretty sure I had all my West warm season garden planted before any of this. And this thing has just gone crazy. So I've done a lot of videos on my um, progress with planting corn from seed and started inside and not started directly in the ground. And that's because I really wanted to do an experiment this year of starting more of my seeds inside rather than outside. And I've really had great success starting a lot of these plants that aren't recommended to start indoors. They're recommended to start directly in the ground. I've had way more success starting these things inside and then bringing them out this year. 
and um, you can see the playlist for how to grow corn um, and you can really see a lot more of the detail and the progress of these plants. But let me just show you what's going on with these. They look amazing. All of these plants were started May 4th or May 5th inside my house. This is a popcorn variety called Mobless or Moveless, um, Moveless Mauve or Mobless Mauve, however you want to say it. Um, <clears throat> and so I did a Three Sisters planting here. So I've got a set of four corn and then like, I guess I should say a six inch square of corn. And then in between each corn plant, I have a pole bean. This is a Kentucky pole bean plant. I also started all of my bean plants indoors this year. And, and then five feet from this planting, I have another planting and then another planting um, for three rows. And then in between each corn and bean planting, I have a squash plant. This particular variety is an ultra butternut squash. Um, it's a really beautiful squash variety. And so I have those planted in between each corn and bean planting. And those were also started from seed indoors on May 4th or 5th. Look how beautiful this is. Most of these plants I would not have been able to plant out in the garden till probably the end of May. And they would now be nowhere near this size. So I'm gonna be getting a lot quicker harvest by having started these indoors. And just as a comparison here next to them, three weeks after I planted this corn, I put some seed in the ground, the exact same seed in the ground. And not only did I have much, let a smaller percentage of germination, but look how small these guys are. I mean, they'll grow, but they are just way smaller than their brothers and sisters over here. And so I did plant some corn all through here. These plants were also started indoors, although they're a different variety of winter squash. I got um, some corn that grew from seed in my house randomly that I started much later after this. And then the seed that I planted in the ground. And you can see the difference between this and this. So I will definitely be starting my corn and squash and beans inside from here on out. Now this was another experiment that I'm doing this year that I'm super excited about. And this is the cut sunflower garden. So I did a video of me planting this first row of bouquet sunflowers right here. I'll have to put the date in the tagline below because I don't remember when it was, but it's been within the last few weeks. These were started in my house. And then after they had been in my house for about two to three weeks, I put them in the ground and look at them. They look awesome. I'm so excited about this cut sunflower garden. And if you're wondering why they're so close together, I spaced them about six to eight inches apart. That is to keep the sunflower head relatively small. I don't want a big sunflower head because these are supposed to be for bouquets um, and flower arrangements. So you want a smaller head than you do um, on those bigger sunflowers. So the more you space them apart, the bigger the head will be. The smaller you space them apart, the smaller the head. And then I'm just gonna be succession planting sunflowers throughout the season up until 60 days before our first frost date. So here is the second planting of sunflowers. These are much smaller, but they're already taking off. And I did plant them out into the ground a little sooner than I did these. I don't think it's gonna negatively affect them, but that's why they look so much smaller. And then this week I'll be starting another set of sunflowers, a pro cut series in my house. And those are supposed to develop in 50 to 60 days. So I'm excited to try that variety of sunflower. And then this will continue down this row throughout the season as long as I can keep it going. And what you see here are watermelon. So what I've done is I grew the watermelon from seed inside my house. Again, it gave me like a month and a half uh, extra growth on these things to start them inside because they are really slow to germinate. But I've got, I think, 12 watermelon plants spaced out in here. And my thinking is that they will sprawl and cover this ground, which will help with weed suppression and will also keep um, the base of the sunflower plants cooler. So I will just succession plant these sunflowers down throughout the watermelon bed, depending on how crazy these vines get, if I'm able to get in here and plant those sunflowers. So we'll see if that works, but that is my current plan is to have this whole thing full of sunflowers throughout the season. And that is the East Garden. So let me take you over to the West Garden and show you what's going on over there. 
Now last year I actually had my gardens flip-flopped. This was my cool season garden and that was my warm season garden. So I actually flipped things this year because this is the west part of the garden and therefore in my mind gets more intense sun towards the end of the day for sure. So this is where I have all my tomatoes, all my peppers, all my eggplants, my zucchini, and some more sweet corn back over here in the corner. I planted all of this out May 13th with a friend. You can see the Q&A for beginning gardeners here. That was a great day. That was so much fun filming that video with my friend who is very much a newbie in the gardening world. And she got to ask all her questions and get them answered by me. Uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> but I do think that I jumped the gun and planting this garden as early as I did. Now in the past three years, that's always when I've planted out my uh, warm season plants like mid-May, which is past our frost date. But the last few years, we've had two really cold snaps happen over Memorial Day weekend. And that is how I lost practically all 70 of my tomato plants that I had planted because the temperatures got down to like 37 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And even though I had all these covered, the frost cloth that were over these tomatoes wasn't enough insulation and I lost almost all of them. However, while I did have to pull out a lot of plants that just looked very sad and did not look like they were gonna recover, I left some in the ground because they were showing signs of life, a little bit of sign of life. I knew their roots were not gonna be affected by that cold snap. It just wasn't cold enough for it to affect their roots because the ground had already warmed up by that point. So I wanted to give those plants a shot, especially since they were varieties that are some of my favorite tomato varieties. And you can see more about the varieties I'm growing in um, my video here about the cold snap that happened and what I'm doing to recover all these tomato plants. So a lot of the tomato plants that you're seeing here were extras that I had grown and were trying to sell. Um, and they were in my garage, so they did not get affected by the cold. And thankfully, I had enough left over to come out and plant almost an entire row of sauce tomatoes. So Roma's and Amish paste tomatoes that I wanted to grow specifically for preserving uh, for the winter. You know, my tomato sauces and salsas and tomato paste. That's practically this whole row right here. And thankfully, I had a lot of those in reserve. And then down the row here are the tomatoes that I bought from a local gardener. Um, he was selling them for a really good price. There were some varieties I've never grown before. Some of them are heirloom, most of them are heirloom. And then there's a few hybrids in here I just wanted to try that I've always heard of. And so I have those planted here at the end of the row. So I'm excited to try some of those varieties. And then what's really cool is my son and I were out here yesterday and it's unbelievable how much growth I have on these tomatoes that I thought I was going to lose. I plan on doing a separate video to really show you the recovery of some of these plants. But, and actually these plants right here that look really nice and full are the ones that I had planted May 13th that were practically down to a nub after that cold snap. And they are even bigger than the ones that I bought from the gardener and planted in the ground two weeks ago. I mean, look at the growth difference on these plants. This is the one that I bought from the farmer. This is the one that I planted that made a recovery. Isn't that crazy? That just goes to show you how much roots were established on these plants. And because they had such good root establishment, they were able to pull through and have this exponential growth here in the last week. These are also cherry tomato varieties, which is why the growth is so prolific. I feel like um, my larger tomatoes over there, they'll show you in a second, that were also recovering from the cold snap are not as big, but even though they look really healthy. So I'm so excited to see how awesome these look and just really how um, fervent plants can be to restore life. So these plants here were all affected by the cold snap as well. They did not look as pitiful as some of the other ones that I had to pull out or the ones I just showed you, but they did look very sad. Um, these are my German pink tomatoes that I absolutely love and I was going to be really sad to lose, but they actually pulled through quite well and have just looked gorgeous. In the last week or so, they've just put on a lot of growth. They look really healthy and I still, I think I'm going to get a really good harvest from these plants. I had mentioned in my tomato video that I was going to be really sad to lose my Paul Robesons. This plant 
and this plant looked really, really sad after the cold snap, and I didn't know if they were going to pull through, but look at the growth on this. This thing looks amazing, um, and I'm really just letting it grow. I'm not going to prune on it till it's a little bit bigger, just because I want it to not be too stressed out. I might pull off some of these suckers, and eventually I'll trim off these lower branches down here, but I'm kind of just letting this thing grow um, and get established before I come in here and stress it out too much, just because it's taken such a beating here in the past month. My spicy pepper row. A lot of these really looked pitiful and sad after the cold snap, but you can see that they really come back with all those baby leaves off the main stem. So I was tempted to yank these out, but I decided to let them stay because I knew I wasn't gonna be able to start them from seed. Uh, I started all of these from seed in February. So to try to restart that process, I just knew I wasn't gonna have enough time. So thankfully, these all really pulled through. You can see some of the damage still on that plant, um, but it's really coming back to life. So I should be able to still get a harvest from these. I have enough plants that even if it's a couple fruit from each plant, it should be enough for my purposes. So they've all kind of come back to, diff to varying degrees, right? This one's still really trying to come back as well as this one. Um, but for the most part, these look really good. This is my second bean garden. These are all bush beans, Blue Lake bush beans that I planted here in the past week. These were grown from seed in my house. Same exact bean as these, which I'm growing from seed in the garden. Again, to do a comparison. Now these should be germinating very soon. And if not, then that tells me that once again, I'm having more success doing them indoors than out. Now I see a seed here that's gotten uncovered and I see some green. So there we go. It's probably happening. I need to give these guys a really good water today. Um, that's probably one of the problems that we're having a lot of drought right now here in Southwest Michigan. And I'm having to do a lot of the watering myself. But this should be a nice patch of bush beans that I planted in the ground by seed and that I'd started in my house from seed. And so I'll have a nice comparison. But again, you can see the head start I get here by starting them indoors. Now beans really do not like cool weather. So waiting to start your beans till you absolutely know that the temperatures are gonna be 51 degrees or more is really what you wanna do. And they grow so fast, you don't necessarily need to worry about getting them outside too soon. Now I wanted to get a head start on these um, before I put them in the ground for two reasons, to get a head start and to see which would do better in germination. So clearly so far, I've had much better success with the ones I started inside. More have germinated and they've germinated a lot quicker. And that has been the trend this past season. When I started them indoors, they germinated much quicker um, than the ones outdoors. And I had a higher percentage of germination than I did outdoors. So, so far that's been the trend with all the things that I've sort of done this germination comparison on. Um, and this garden behind me is another example of that. This is my sweet popcorn, excuse me, my sweet corn bed and my zucchini bed. And all of this was started indoors in early May as well. And this corn is a little bit smaller than the popcorn, which is ironic since it is, uh, was started a few days ahead of the other corn. But I just believe this corn takes longer to get going. Um, it still looks really healthy. It was stunted a little bit by the cold snap we had on Memorial Day. Um, but otherwise it's looking really good. And these zucchinis have put out their flowers this week. I've got flowers on here. Um, most of these flowers are male flowers and you can tell because the stamen in there is pointy. Usually a female flower will have like three stamens instead of one. This is the Costada Romanesco zucchini variety that I really like and it's known for its really big squash flowers, which is one of the reasons that I grew it. I also grow it because it's Italian and I love any Italian variety of plant. Uh, living there three years, I grew such an appreciation for Italian culture and Italian food that I just love any Italian variety of plant I can get my hands on. But this one's looking really great. Um, I was looking for a female flower so I could pollinate any of these. Once this opens, I'll do a hand pollination just to make sure that the fruit completely grows in. Um, I haven't seen a ton of bees out here. I've seen some, but you can take the flower from a male, a male flower and you can hand pollinate the stamen of a female flower just to make sure that your fruit 
fully matures. Otherwise, it'll rot and fall off. So I'm keeping an eye on this flower just to make sure it gets pollinated. You can also use a paintbrush and take the pollen from the male flower and put it on the pollen on the female flower. Now here's the problem that I noticed last night. I kind of had noticed that these eggplant were looking light, like a light, light green instead of a dark green, but I just hadn't been out here to really pay too much attention to them for some reason. And then last night when I was in here, I took a closer look and sure enough, this happens every year. These flea beetles get in here and they just eat these leaves to lace. It's unreal. The minute my eggplant take off, this is what happens. So unfortunately, I didn't get out here soon enough to really eliminate some of this from happening. And I'm hoping these guys will recover. They should. I mean, I believe the rest of the garden is a testament to that. Um, but I need to spray these with neem oil or an insecticidal soap, which is what I did last night. If you're going to put stuff on your plants, make sure you do it in the evening when it's cool and there's not direct contact from the sun. If you were to do it in the morning or midday, you could possible, possibly get like a chemical burn on your leaves. But by doing it in the evening, it gets time for that uh, product to absorb and not affect the plant negatively from the sun. I generally try not to use harsh chemicals on my plants, but sometimes I have to go a little tougher than I want. But in this case, neem oil or insecticidal soap should knock out these flea beetles. At least it has in the past and I just have to stay on top of it or they'll come back. So I'll keep you updated on this. Um, hopefully these will pull through. I have a lot of them and they're all affected by these flea beetles. So hopefully I'll be able to get these guys back up and running here in the next week or so. And the only other thing to show you in this garden are the peas that I planted back in early April directly in the ground. And they have been okay. Again, I feel like spotty germination on really on how many I put in the ground and it's just taken them a long time to get going so next year I'm going to be starting my peas inside um, they are just now flowering it's been probably five to six weeks since I put them in the ground and I'm just now getting flowers so hopefully we will get a good harvest from these and they won't uh, you know peas do not like the warmer weather and they'll just start dying off at that point and there is some, you know, yellowing leaves on the ones over there on that fence. Uh, but these are first 13, I think it's the variety. Uh, it's an English pea, so, so more. you can freeze or put in soups. I wanted a lot more of this, those kind of type of peas that I could preserve this year. So hopefully I'll still get a good harvest from those. I am slightly disappointed with their growth and germination. So again, I'm just gonna grow them inside next year to get a better head start, better germination because I was really hoping to be harvesting from these by now. Um, so what I've done is I've come in here and I've interplanted my cucumber plants because these were so slow going, I didn't want to waste my trellises. So I actually moved the cucumber plants that I had planted over here and have put them here along this arched trellis to hopefully get going. Now cucumbers don't generally like to be transplanted. So I tried to get a really big root ball I've been trying to water them really well and I'm probably going to have to side dress them with some composted manure just to make sure that they get established and really get going. But again, in the last week since moving them, they are looking really good. Or they're looking better. I feel like they could look better than this, but they're looking better than they did when they were over here. So hopefully this year I'll have a cucumber harvest. My last two years, my cucumber harvests have just not been very good which is ironic because i've always had really good cucumber harvest so i'm hoping this year will be my year to finally get some cucumbers it may not be my year to have peas though <laughs> you know there's just always something that doesn't do well and something that does really well that surprises you in the end but that's what's going on in the garden that's what's growing here in june we're harvesting strawberries we're harvesting the last of our greens our herbs are definitely uh, kicking in. We've been harvesting our oregano and parsley and sage and chamomile and holy basil and basil that I started back in February and early March. We've been harvesting that for weeks. Um, we've been harvesting the outer leaves of our cabbage to put in like a Asian slaw or an Asian salad. The radishes, we just finished up the, that harvest and are still enjoying those inside. And hopefully here in the next week, we'll be eating some of our peas and a lot more strawberries. 
As always, my name is Landon Gilfillan here at Pepper and Pine Garden Design, growing gardeners and their gardens, and I'll see you in the next video.